Hundreds of inmates here at Solano Prison in Vacaville are hoping for a second chance, parole. And California officials think the key is rehabilitation. Hurt people, hurt people. These prisoners are doing sentences like 25 years to life, some for the most heinous crimes imaginable. The hurt that we carry, we take it out on somebody else. They don't know if they'll ever get out. Still, they're trying to understand what went wrong and how they ended up here. Uh, I seen you hand up, uh, Mr. Uh, Glass. You know, one of my biggest fears in the past was uh, rejection, right? And uh, communication skills were lacking, to say the least, because of my alcohol and drug abuse. In my family, a, a lot of it always went back to, you know, quit complaining, I'll give you something to cry about. Some of these inmates are trained to work as mentors to fellow offenders. Take Jose Hernandez. We can't do nothing to change the past of what we did because it's written in permanent ink. But we do have a choice today. We have the tools now that we didn't have 20 or 25 years ago. In 1993, Hernandez strangled his ex-girlfriend to death. Last year, the parole board found him suitable for release, but Governor Brown reversed it, saying he thought Hernandez was too high a risk to public safety. I'm going to go back to the board, and uh, I'm going to go back to the psychologist and be as best as a person as I can be every single day. Programs like these are part of a major shift that Jerry Brown has brought to criminal justice. For the first time in decades, rehabilitation for long-term inmates is a funding priority. Some classes are being aimed directly at lifers, from anger management to how to reconcile with their own family members if they're released. The uh, situation. Instructor Lawanda Green is working with these inmates on developing empathy for their victim. Probably I'm at a point where I just, I don't care anymore, right? Because somebody calls me to be a victim. The toughest part is when you have the person who believes they were valid in doing their crime, the gang-related crime where they believe it was either me or them. Uh, I had no other way to make another decision. Today is graduation for one group of lifers who've completed a series of classes. I'm really grateful to be here. I've never done this before. The special and guest is not a typical graduation and speaker. And Six years ago, Teresa Cordemanche lost her son Matt, a Fairfield City Councilman who was shot and killed at age 22, a victim of mistaken identity. She remembers the night she got the call. <laughs> it was my friend Terry, and she said, I think Matt got shot. I'm like, what? And she goes, yeah, Teresa. I think he got shot, and I said, okay, let me go. Let me call his phone, and I kept calling his phone, and he didn't answer. This is one way that inmates hear about the impact crime has on their victims and families. James Ward responds passionately. I could do a 1,000 years in prison, 10,000 years in prison, and it would never match what you have gone through. So when you think about unfairness, my fellow murderers, think about her, and that is real unfairness. Can I say that I have been treated unfairly because the governor pulls my date? Ward has spent half his life in prison for killing his ex-girlfriend over 30 years ago. He's now 64. After being turned down five times, he was recently found suitable for parole and will be released November 5th, unless Governor Brown blocks it. Please, I want to get out of prison, but I understand the cost that that symbolizes. Ward says the classes inside prison have helped him understand the pain he's caused others. I have the opportunity to get found suitable and get out and pick up the pieces of my life. They don't have any place where they can go appeal and say, bring my loved one back. They don't have that, so that's... You know, I think about that. Mr. Sternberg. In past decades, only a trickle of lifers got out. Parole boards were conservative, and past governors reversed up to 95% of parole recommendations. But a 2008 state Supreme Court ruling made it harder to deny parole on the basis of the crime itself. Since then, nearly 2,300 lifers have gotten out. 
Deputy Director for Rehabilitation Roger Meyer says it's now a priority to help these offenders prepare for life on the outside. Some of these inmates, when they came to prison, there were no cell phones. They've never used an ATM before. Um, they've, for 20 some years, they've been told what to eat, what to wear, when to get up, when to report. It would be remiss if we didn't try to ensure that they are successful when they do go out to society. These programs promote personal growth for the inmates and help show they're suitable for parole. Rehabilitation also reduces the chance that offenders will commit new crimes, says Cynthia Flores DeLion, who heads the Office of Victim Rights and Services. It's, it's an opportunity for them to now internalize and say, okay, how can I make my life better so that I can get out and be successful and not re-victimize? In fact, statistics show that lifers who get out are among the least likely to commit another felony, says UC Berkeley criminologist Barry Crisberg. Now, part of that is because they stay such a long time, and when they get out, they're pretty old. I mean, the single thing we know from criminology is that getting older reduces your probability of committing crime. If you combine that with programs preparing people for release, you can, you can make those, those rates even better. I'm thankful that I have that, that I can share with them. For Bridget Fitting Nevin, statistics are no reassurance. Her father, Timothy Fitting, was killed in 1990 by an employee who struck him in the head with a wrench 24 times. If you cross that line, that you're capable of crossing that line in the future. There was always this comfort that I had, knowing that this person was in jail and that, you know, I was protected from that. I mean, this is put together by our family. In June, her father's killer was found suitable for parole. Nevin worries that the programs inside prison are coaching offenders on what to say to the parole board. Um, our community, I feel, at large, is put into a vulnerable situation. It's, in, in, in my humble opinion, some of these parolees are ticking time bombs. We're basing all our comfort on statistic probability that now these individuals aren't capable of committing crimes, just based on their age. Nevin will urge the governor to reverse parole for her father's killer. For lifers who are found suitable for parole, freedom brings new challenges. Here in downtown Berkeley, the nonprofit Options Recovery Services offers ex-offenders a place to land when they get out. Tom Gorham is program director. When we started Options Recovery Service, we didn't have housing. We didn't have a mental health clinic. And this program is built on what the clients show us that they need. And one thing they needed was a safe place to stay. Two years ago, that's what David Hillary was looking for. He had been granted parole after serving 18 years on a life sentence for second degree murder. What do I do? It's like, I've been gone for 18 years. I didn't have a driver's license. I didn't have insurance. I'm on parole, I don't have a doctor. Finding these, these little nuances of what being a responsible man was, learning that is a tall task. While behind bars, Hillary obtained certification to work as a substance abuse counselor through a program run by Options. After his release, Options gave Hillary a room in transitional housing and put him to work teaching classes for recovering addicts at Options. So. Two things in life that show up quite frequently, triggers and warning signs. What is the difference? For some reason, me and my boyfriend... But my amends argument. is living different, because I don't necessarily believe I have the right to a second chance. I believe that if you see my actions are indicative of a different person, have some compassion. California still has some 26,000 lifers in prison, more than any other state. Criminologist Barry Crisberg says there's no one-size-fits-all solution to crime and punishment. The issue is not, not punishment. We're going to punish these people. The question is, what's enough? You know, is 20 years enough? Is 25 years enough? Is 35 years enough? As policymakers grapple with that question, the state hopes to expand programs to help more lifers win freedom.